welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, it's my proud privilege to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Captain C.R. Gopinath, um, who's our speaker this afternoon. Uh, he's a product of India's most respected defense academy, the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun. Uh, Gopi, as he's affectionately, affectionately called by all those who know him, went on to serve the Indian Army for eight years as a commissioned officer. Uh, it says, uh, flying may be his latest pas passion, but it is printed as lying, maybe his latest <laughs> passion. <laughs> in the, in my, <laughs> so somebody left out an F. Uh, but at heart, uh, Captain Gopinath is a farmer. Before his foray into aviation, he was a successful sericulturist in Karnataka who had tried his hand at many other crops, which won him the Rolex International Award for Enterprise in 1996 uh, for his seeking to break new ground with the project Ecological Silk Farming to improve living standards. Uh, in the early 1990s, while in Singapore, he read about a girl who had started a helicopter company to fly American tourists to Vietnam uh, after the war had destroyed all infrastructure in Vietnam. It inspired uh, Captain to do something similar in India. Accompanied by a close friend from his army days, he began thinking of what no entrepreneur had thought of doing in India before to start a private sector commercial air service. Uh, today, Deccan Aviation, headquartered in Bangalore, has 11 he helicopters and small aircrafts operate out of eight major cities and locations, spanning the entire length and breadth of India. The company is India's largest and most reputed private air charter company uh, and flies also to Sri Lanka. Uh, encouraged by his commercial success, Captain Gopinath launched Yet another first to his credit as an innovative and a tireless entrepreneur, Air Deccan, India's first low fare, no frills, scheduled airline service. Uh, launched on 25th August 2003, Air Deccan connects the hitherto unconnected routes like Hubli, Belgaum, Vijayawada, with the metros of Bang Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, and Mumbai. Uh, starting with a modest of four flights a day, Air Deccan today flies 72 flights every day, covering 22 destinations and 10 aircrafts in Peninsula India. Uh, they also go to Delhi, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, in launching this airline, uh, Captain Gopinath has created many firsts. These include India's first airline to issue only electronic tickets, a fully web-based reservation system which literally brings airline ticketing to one's drawing room and a 24-hour multilingual call center, uh, which makes ticketing just a phone call away. Air Deccan is also the first commercial airline to be granted permission by the regulatory authorities to sell advertisement space on aircraft exteriors. Uh, he was born in April 1951. Uh, he's generally addressed as Captain G.R. Gopinath, but also called Gopi, uh, 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 with uh, Air Deccan already becoming more and more popular with air travelers, uh, Captain is well on his way to realize his vision of making air travel affordable and reliable to the common man. Today he will be speaking to us on the revolution in low fare air travel. Uh, so Dr. Kasurangan and Dr. Huja. And, uh, <coughs> Friends, uh, really a great honor to be amidst you, uh, especially this uh, <coughs> distinguished uh, gathering here. I'm a little nervous <laughs> because I'm not a technocrat. I'm not an academy, academician or academic. So my lecture won't be PowerPoint or pedagogic. It'll be more a, an entrepreneurial story uh, as to how uh, uh, we made a difference, how what I saw, which was uh, ridiculed uh, both when I started the helicopter company and more recently with the airline, as to what impact it can 
do to the country and to the economy, and how entrepreneurs uh, uh, create wealth and are needed to challenge and disturb the status quo. Because uh, whether it's uh, private sector or the public sector, uh, complacency, uh, a comfortable, cozy, uh, you could almost say an incestuous kind of uh, uh, partnership which will create into a monopolies or price cartelization can be uh, sometimes uh, if you don't listen to consultants and if you just go after your heart, how you can probably, uh, uh, when you face things head on, you know, uh, the doors open for you and how you can make a difference. Uh, if it is the uh, aim of uh, a country to have a developed uh, economy, which uh, in the widest sense of that word, means transforming society. Then, on a societal scale, then you need a, a development strategy, which is uh, democratically inclusive and uh, ecologically and economically sustainable. And that uh, development strategy must be scalable. Otherwise, uh, you will have what is classically termed as you'll be transferring technology without transforming society. If you have a development model which requires huge investments, but is successful because of that huge investment in a particular island uh, of domain, and then, but if it is not uh, replicable, then it's not a true development strategy for transforming society. So lo, you need uh, to have, similarly in a, a business model, a, a, a business strategy which is uh, capable of uh, scaling up and touching uh, uh, a larger number of people to transform the industry. So my lecture is uh, something to do on these lines. And like Goethe, the German poet said, uh, dare to dream and begin it. Uh, boldness has genius and magic to it. I think all of uh, true entrepreneurship uh, is in these lines. So when I came to Bangalore, I studied in a small village school on the banks of uh, uh, the river attributed to the Kaveri called Hemavati, in a small village called Garur. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Karnataka literature would know. There's a very famous literature short story writer from that village called Garur Ramaswami Anga, who immortalized village life. I was born there. I went to the local village school, went barefoot, studied in the Kadam medium school. And one day, my headmaster came and made an announcement that there's a competitive exam for the Sainik school. So I gave my name and got the application form filled. My father was a school teacher. He was in some other village. So I went to my grandfather and took some money and gave it to the headmaster and wrote that uh, application and went to the district headquarters and wrote the exam. And the first exam I failed. And the reason I failed was because I was studying in a Canada medium school. And I, so I didn't understand the questions. So so I wrote a letter saying that we fail, I failed because I didn't understand the question. So they gave another exam. I think a lot of people were there like me. And I passed the second exam because that was in English. So I left my village uh, when I was about 11. And I went to science school and ended up in the National Defense Academy and the IMA. And for about eight years, I was in the army in various parts of the country. I went straight to Bangladesh and the war broke out. Then I came back and came back to my village uh, because I, I thought I must do things after my heart. And I was a bit restless. And I had built a dam across the uh, uh, river. 
and my family had lost all the lands. And in the true sense of that word of a refugee, we had, people had become emotional and physical refugees. So I was wondering what to do uh, to chart out a new course for my life. And I asked my family, uh, and they said that they had got some new lands allotted in a different part of the uh, state, about 100 miles away, in a remote area. And as usual, they were again either forest lands or grazing lands. In Karnataka, they had these large grazing lands which had been allotted, uh, which used to be Maharaja's grazing lands, which was again allotted to agriculture because they had taken away your agriculture lands. So you lose forests both ways. You know, you lose fresh forests, virgin forests, and again you lose forests. So in one sense, that, that debate is there. So I asked them, where are these lands? And they said, it is in some remote place, and they didn't want to go there. There was no access, there was no roads, there was no electricity, there were no schools. So I wa walked these uh, five miles from the nearest village and saw these lands, and I said, okay, let me live on this land and do something. So I went, uh, came to Bangalore, picked up my army tent, picked up an army tent from this Kabadi Bazaar, and I had an army rifle, and I had a small Harijan boy in my village. So I went and camped there, and I lived there for 10 years, 1982 uh, and uh, I went, died many a death, uh, because farmers are usually in debt, in debt, and the debt, you know, as you know, uh, though of course, sometimes it's exaggerated, but people do commit suicide. So I co got out of that, and uh, I, I did a lot of work in ecological silk farming, and ironically, and what I did was, I had a lot to do with low-cost farming, because I felt that farmers were in debt because their inputs were going higher, so yield goes up, but eventually the yield drops, and the inputs don't come down, and you get into your classic debt trap. So I was wondering how to farm with nature so that I could bring down my input costs and increase my productivity. And I found that what was ecologically not sound was not econo economically viable. So I demonstrated over a period of nearly almost eight to nine years how to take sustainable crops uh, and be in profit. So I cleared all my debts and I became the largest uh, uh, silicon cocoon producer. And my children were growing up and I came to Bangalore and I set up a, an agriculture consultancy company and I was dividing my time between Bangalore and, and uh, my farm. And when I was playing uh, squash with an army colleague of mine who was a pilot, and I asked him what was he doing and he said he was looking for a job. And he didn't have any job and he ended up as a, a regional manager in a courier company. So I said, why are you in a courier company? He said, look, you're looking for a job, and there were no jobs to be had. And there was not a single helicopter company in the uh, public sector with license for charter. Uh, you had helicopters which were owned by the Ambani's and Tata's and Vijamalya in those days. And he had gone for a Vijamalya interview and come back because he had only one helicopter, and that job was already taken. So and every helicopter in the company was owned by corporates. So if it's Vijay Malia, he needs to sell more beer. If it's Rahul Bajaj, he needs to sell more scooters. They're not customer uh, focused because they're not customer dependent. So it hit me like lightning that we had hundreds of pilots, excellent people from the Army, Air Force and Navy, good people. They were not just pilots. They used to command the unit, go to flying, go back to commanding units. and without jobs, and I knew that I mean, that was the key to the success of any company. And these were the days uh, when reforms were blowing. Vishwan Mohan Singh was the finance minister, uh, Chidambaram was the commerce minister. The reason I'm saying it, it had a historical sense uh, to the decisions that I took. And there was not a single helicopter company in the country, and there were hundreds of pilots without jobs, doing odd part jobs like administrative officers and security officers. And China had uh, uh, brazenly embraced capitalism without abandoning, abandoning communism. And Russia, con communism had collapsed. And historically speaking, we had uh, leanings with Russia. And we always looked at a lens. And that lens was through China because we are rivals. Like America always looked at Russia whenever it wanted to do anything during Cold War days. So I knew that India could no longer remain in isolation. We were on an inexorable path 
in my mind of both economic reforms and, and market growth. And, and I took this decision in that tennis court as I was playing, I said, my God, I mean, I knew that helicopters were a great, uh, uh, what we had a slogan once, you know, highways in the sky. Uh, the most visible application of helicopters are uh, glamour, which we do, you know, flying uh, Amitabh Bachchan or Shah Rukh Khan, or flying Sonia Gandhi and Mrs. Mr. Vajpayee, uh, who's over the, or the political big wigs. But helicopters are used in a variety of applications. They're used for uh, power line survey, power line maintenance, which we don't do, uh, because uh, all over the world, uh, they don't shut down power. They go in the helicopter and fix it, minor things. So the production is unhindered. Uh, because they know in the helicopter you don't get electrocuted. Power line surveys, which we do now, uh, gas pipeline surveys, aerial photography, aerial mapping, the kind of technological advances that we had, if you wanted a three corridor mapping for a pipeline laying between uh, Assam to Chennai, I mean, it's possible now to take a helicopter, put those equipment, and get a 100 feet by 3,000 mile 3D map. Uh, geophysical survey for mining. Uh, mining is getting privatized because they felt uh, mines are deep in the you know earth and uh, deep in the bowels of the country, so it's a national wealth. They didn't want to privatize it, but now I think they find that soft egg gives you more wealth than metals. So. Helicopters are a great uh, infrastructure for doing geophysical survey. We've got a helicopter now continuously doing geophysical survey for the world's largest uh, mining company, Rio Tinto, which is a Fortune 500 company, and also DBS. We sent our pilots to Australia recently to get them trained to do very low level, flying at 100 feet, carrying an electromagnetic uh, bird, as they call it, and do survey. Uh, aerial photography, aerial mapping, medical evacuation, lifting uh, underslung loads to remote areas, uh, firefighting, which we don't do, logging, which we don't do, so they don't build roads into the forest. And uh, news gathering, we have a helicopter with NGTV on contract. Heli tourism, uh, we have pioneered, if you can use that word, tourism in the country, where for the up end of the market, if somebody wants to go to, uh, to the Mysore Palace, into Humpy, uh, then you can call up at 10 in the night and take the job in the morning. So I felt uh, I knew all these applications, and it happened probably in this fraction of a second. And I told my friend, why don't you resign your job and join me? And uh, he had won a gallantry award uh, for his flying in Siachen Glacier, uh, outstanding pilot. So I, I said, why don't you join me? And one day he walked into my small agriculture office, and I was dividing my time between a farm and said, I have resigned my job, so what do you want me to do? So it hit me, uh, and in 95, we incorporated the company, and it took us uh, almost three years to get our license, to get our act together in terms of funding and various things, because we had no money. Because Constantly, people come up to me and ask, uh, how did you raise your money? It's a capital-intensive industry. And I always say, uh, energy is uh, more important than capital. And I think ideas combined with energy will get you capital. So we had uh, finally a license at the end of two and a half years. We didn't bribe anybody, which is probably surprising because I went repeatedly to the people in Delhi and met and met the minister, met the secretary of civil aviation. Of course, it's not easy. We could have we mortgaged our property, whatever we had, whatever money we had. So I told my friend, these 15, 20, 30 lakhs that we put, we may lose everything if we don't get a license at the end of two to three years. So, but we were relentless. We went after it and finally we got the license. I went to the chief minister and I said, I want land to build a, a maintenance facility because I knew that that was key to our growth. And I got land. The chief minister, there's another airfield here called Jekur airfield. 
I don't know if people, if people have seen it. We've got a fantastic facility there. And he gave me land, the chief minister, to build a facility. I had a license. Then finally I got somebody to give me a helicopter. Uh, to curse the story short, uh, we got a single line fax uh, because uh, Mr. Nasimura called for elections. And, uh, and they lost the elections. And we had a disaster after that. Mr. Vajpayee took over. And after 13 days, Mr. Vajpayee resigned. And for about next 20 days, there was no prime minister till Mr. Devagoda became prime minister with 16 MPs. And somebody said, you know, I think there was an Archilakshman cartoon, the, the tail wagging the dog or something like that. Uh, we had uh, a small party he heading the national government with 20, 18 MPs or something like that. So when I got a one-line fax from this company, which had agreed to fund me with a, for a helicopter, saying that we are nervous about India and we are withdrawing our funding for you. Then uh, Mr. Devagada took charge. And of course, it lasted only 10, 11 months. The reason I'm saying is that these things have sometimes bearing on your dreams or your plans. So the best of plans uh, get, get uh, dashed. So we didn't lose uh, courage or hope. Finally, one Japanese uh, came down here. And he, contrary to all the management uh, uh, theories that you learn, Americans are aggressive and Japanese are conservative. The Japanese, uh, there was an Asian crisis that hit, which I knew. And the Asian crisis grounded a lot of helicopters in Asia because of the currency crisis. Uh, if you are borrowed at, uh, in all in dollars, and if you are supposed to send 10 lakhs a month, now if the currency becomes 300 rupees a dollar, then without anything happening in your business plan, without anything happening in your own country, now you need to send uh, uh, 30 lakhs a month to same, send the same dollars. So there are a lot of helicopters on the ground. So somebody in my contact told me that there's a Japanese company uh, which has got a lot of helicopters which are on the ground. And he came down. We had no business uh, track record, so we had no balance sheets. All that we had were dreams and a good team and uh, projected balance sheets. And he came here, and this little this story, we had no money to show, and no bank references and things like that. And he came, and he had a drink with me in Western Hotel, and we spent about two, three hours together. And he went back and sent me a fax saying that we are ready to give you the helicopter. So now I had a helicopter on lease, and I had uh, uh, a license, I had land. So all that I did was, venture capital was very uh, nascent in those days. Whatever venture capital was there was uh, restricted to software in a very, very limited manner. And uh, Infosys uh, was still, uh, you know, uh, emerging as a star, but still not big. So the early days of venture. So I went, uh, again, ironically, I went to the, India's first venture capital company called TDICI, uh, which is part of ICICI. And I went and met them, and uh, they did not give the venture capital, because they said we are focused on software technology. So I did the typical Indian manner and uh, found somebody in India who was an uneducated Sindhi. And uh, I sold my plan to him. He understood this concept. And without batting an eyelid, I gave him a small equity. But I said, I'm only giving you equity, provided you want to back me with a lot of funds whenever I want it in terms of short-term debts. I don't want to part with all my equity. And he agreed to that, and he gave me equity for a small uh, 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 disinvestment in the company. And we started with one helicopter out of Jakur. And uh, 
we grew uh, within a span of uh, six years. We're in our seventh year now. From one to 12 helicopters. We have 10 helicopters and two small planes. In eight bases, uh, we have an operating base in Colombo to cater to Sri Lanka, which is started six months ago. And up to Jammu, we have a helicopter in Jammu uh, catering to the Jammu and Kashmir state. Nobody wants to go there because of terrorism, so I had all army pilots and air force pilots who are ready to go. Also doing a fantastic uh, uh, contract for Vaishnav Devi Shrine, which no business plan told me that a large part of my flying will come from uh, dropping flowers and temples, taking Swamiji's to uh, a, a city, or taking taking Swamiji's to a city to meet a corporate, or taking corporate to the Swami. Uh, every other day, you find the Swamiji's hiring a helicopter, and also corporates wanting to go to Tirupati or going to, you know, Velangani or any of these uh, places, and. We also got a fabulous contract in Kashmir, in Jammu, for Vaishnavi temples. It has a walk-in pilgrim of six million people. So we got a contract there for taking pilgrims from the lower part of the helipad to the upper part of the helipad. And we created eight uh, bases in the country, from Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, Bombay, uh, Surat. Surat, we have a helicopter with the British company for oil, supporting oil rigs. And then... Uh, Ranchi in the east, and Delhi, and then Jammu. The highlight of this uh, six years was that uh, we were in profit in the very first year. And the reason we were, why we were in the profit in the very first year is because we ran the company uh, very, very on a tight shooting budget. We scrounged every rupee. We slept on floors. When I say I slept on floors, I really literally mean that. Our pilots were tough. They multitask. They were the salespeople. They used to clean the aircraft, and and uh, and that helped us. So from the same leasing company, the Japanese company, I took the second helicopter. I took the third. I took the fourth. I took the fifth. I took the sixth. So I got six helicopters. Then it, then uh, two years ago, we bought off all the helicopters that we leased from them, and uh, we also bought four more helicopters, and grew. We are still a very small company in corporate size. But uh, we became synonymous with charter aviation. We were in profit. And uh, we became the largest uh, helicopter charter company. So it taught us uh, a few things in these six years in terms of uh, how to deal with uh, government, how to deal with bureaucracy. It is here to stay. It is a systemic problem. It sometimes, I think, uh, is eating into the vitals of this country. And everybody is helpless. You go to the, I remember our events, I, I had an I, IG of police who asked for a, a transfer. And uh, Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister then, I don't want to give the name, wrote on, on the file, OK. And she couldn't find her file because within the bureaucracy, it got lost. What I'm saying is that uh, I'm not pointing any fingers. That There are so many extraordinarily uh, bright, brilliant, well-meaning, visionary bureaucrats who are, who are really, you know, who, who go to the IAS? The, the, the best and the brightest in the country go to the IAS. So obviously they are, they are very good. But there is this frustration there because everybody is a victim of the system that we have created. Uh, so we we learned how to deal with this bureaucracy. We learned how to deal with the political establishment. And it gave us a good, good insight uh, into doing what I embarked on 15 months ago. We had a slogan in our uh, helicopter business where I had a helicopter on an island with a girl fishing. And the slogan said, if it's in the map, we will get you there. What uh, I was trying to do was to tell the corporates that you want a chopper, and just call us. And you showed us in the map, whichever it is, we'll take you there. And very, very frequently, both political uh, VIPs and corporates would call us because they wanted to go to places which were remote. And it was a very powerful slogan. 
and I would constantly get calls asking them to take them to various parts and sometimes we had to find a way of taking him there. So I called my pilot one day, I remember I think it was Mr. Krishna once, he wanted to go to some temple and it was too far for a helicopter so I had a small plane and somebody said that there is an airfield there and it happened to be an airfield of uh, some private company which used to be owned by Birlas long ago. Before that it used to be owned by a British company. He had built a small airstrip. Then I discovered one day the biggest secret which helped me launch this airline. We had 400 airfields in the country which were unconnected. There were small airstrips, grass airstrips, gravel airstrips, good airfields, some in good shape, some under disrepair, some under disuse. And many times we would send a truck 15 days in advance and get that airfield cleared up because these small planes could land in these small grass strips. If somebody had uh, put a boulder there, clear it, if there's a small branch there just sticking out into the runway, cut it, or there's a mound uh, created by a termite, clear it, you know, those kind of things. And we used to land in all these strips. And uh, there was something that was buzzing in my mind. And these calls, you know, became frequent. I used to get a lot of calls from common people who used to see this ad and call me and ask me to take them to Vijayawada or to Hubli or to Kolhapur or to Dehradun. And these calls became so much, so many. And I also had Mr. Chandra Banadu and uh, uh, people like them asking me in a very conventional way, why don't you start an airline and we'll support you and go to Udhivijayawada, go to Hubli. Because many of these ministers were taking helicopters. Sometimes uh, when they were not entitled by the government, but they would take it and, and they couldn't afford to pay this. Or rather, the money was too high. And I would tell them it will cost them two lakhs. And then he would say, look, I'm going on my own. Can you reduce the price? And then he would come and sit in my lounge and say, look, I can't afford this every time. Why don't you start a flight to Hubli? So there was something that I know I was missing. I said, I was, and I didn't know what it was because I didn't want to start another airline in the conventional sense. And one day, Dr. Kota Harinarayana came to my office. And he said, uh, uh, Dr. Arun Chori called him and said, look, uh, don't you have one man in this country? You're a man in scientists and space. And can't you inspire anybody in this country to start a, a regional airline? And he told him, I'll go and meet Captain Gopi and talk to him, because he's a successful person in charter business. By which time, I was already thinking. And this is about two and a half years ago. And one day I was in Phoenix Airport. I was on the way to Grand Canyon to see a helicopter company. And I was waiting for this uh, helicopter to come and pick me up. And I was there in the airport and I saw a plaque there. And that airport was posting. And it said that that airport was handling something like 1,000 odd flights a day and about more than 100,000 passengers a day. And I just did some numbers. I said, it was translated to something like about 30 million passengers and 1,000 flights. The whole country, all our airports put together, we were, we were doing about 450 to 500 flights a day. And I said, this one airport, back of beyond, not the biggest of cities, in the desert, was doing 1,000 flights. And... Uh, I had gone on a Southwest Airlines where I had paid hardly anything and had a, there was a napkin there which said 30 years, one mission, low fares. And they are standing there and then it hit me. I said, every company in the country today, in the last four, four years, were talking about the growth, whether it was uh, people selling uh, pharmaceuticals, people selling uh, scooters, motorcycles, their growth was coming from rural India. Everybody was talking of the growth of their business, whether it was a cigarette company, whether it was a, any company. Their growth was coming from middle class India. And I said, if everybody is talking of this growth from middle class India, why not aviation? Why, is, why can't aviation happen from middle class? And, uh, you know, like, you know, a sudden 
I, this is already buzzing, so it just happened. And exactly like what I did in the helicopter business, I came back and uh, I made up my mind then that, you know, that the country now was no longer different, was no longer the same what it was 15 years ago. It was no longer what it was even seven, six, seven years ago. There was a tremendous fundamental change that had taken place in the country. There was so much of resurgence, so much of self-confidence, ecological management of this, of this consumerism with all its ills. But that was the key to our economic growth. So I said if the country has to grow at this at the rate in which the government is now projecting 6 to 8% GDP. I don't think it is possible for this growth to happen unless aviation itself grows, unless aviation itself becomes central and integral to economic planning and growth, unless aviation grows deep into the bowels of this country, deep into the innards of this country. I don't think you will be able to have an equitable economic growth. So for me, the vision that came was a billion seats. And I just said a billion seats means about 70,000 flights a day. From the present 600 flights that we have today, what it meant was, it was a nice catchy slogan. I have a, slogan, I have a big poster in my office, one billion seats. And it's not an impossible lumber. It's not an impossible dream. I, I felt that it is a very realistic number because when, I, when we say today 15 million passenger seats, that is the total number that is traveling in India today, 15 to 16 million is the total number of passengers who are traveling by air today. What it means is not 15 million different people, it is 3 to 4 million people traveling 3 to 4 times. So all that you need is these two to three hundred million people, which is our middle class, they need to travel three to four times a year. China already has 800 commercial aircrafts and 80 million people traveling. We have just 165 commercial aircrafts. We started much ahead of them 20 years ago. Today they have 800 aircrafts, we have 150, and there's already a, a blueprint which I saw. China has made a blueprint for 1,900 aircrafts by 2020, they're already going about building the infrastructure. So I knew that uh, this was not only a, 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 a necessary dream, it was a re realizable dream. So I came back and I said that every Indian can fly. And I needed to create a business model and a business strategy to realize this vision because every Indian can f fly can be a, a great slogan, but how, how do you realize that? You need a business strategy for that. And the business strategy that I, I, I put together was to have the lowest fares so that our fares are comparable to train travel to begin with. Uh, it must be 25 to 30% below AC first class. A large number of seats must be uh, AC second class. And again, quite a few seats below AC second class into a normal two, two tier. And 15 million people are traveling by train today. That is the official figure, so it must be more because of the kind of ticketless travel we have, because of the kind of people who travel on top of trains. It's close to 20 million who travel or which more than 300,000 travel by first class. If you could tap that figure, because what we had earlier was regional airlines who were in the regions, regional airlines who went out of business because I think they're ahead of their time, because like in life, like Shakespeare said, there's a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood it's a mall to fortune. It's something like that. I think there's a sense of timing in your business. So I think the earlier airlines were ahead of the time. You need a large middle class to be able to do this. And also the model has to be right. You need security, you need a 
larger fleet. You need to fly more number of hours because if you are a regional airline in Karnataka, you will fly two to three hours and you are, at the end of the day you are on the ground. So the business model had to be right. So the lowest fares where we could make the vision meaningful and if you wanted to say every Indian can fly, then you need people not only from Bombay to Delhi, but you also need people from Kolhapur to go to Bombay, people from Ludhiana to come to Belgaum. So when we announced this plan of a Deccan, some of the competitors openly asked the government to put an entry barrier. And one of the entry barriers that they suggested was that the new players must stick to the regional routes. And I said that if you want to avoid the pitfalls of a dual economy, wherein you have islands of excellence or prosperity with vast areas of... I think the problem today we have is not that people are against reforms. The problem that the Congress and left that they're having after the BGP went out of power is, I think, the problem of how to get the reforms percolating deep into the interiors. Because it's not easy to transform an economy overnight. So the people who don't get the benefits of the new globalization or the new economy, like in Russia, they will go and say, let's roll back the reforms because we are not received the reforms. So the problem is not with reforms itself. The problem is how to get these reforms into the interiors. So I told the civil aviation minister, in the earlier civil aviation minister, I said, why don't you get me to talk to the civil aviation ministry and the DGCA? Because one of the problems that I faced was how to get the uh, obstacle from the competitors to make my airline happen. Because one of the demands that they made was that keep the new players out. So I said, unless you have air connectivity along with the internet, along with the highways, parallelly, because in a country like Af of ours, for you to be globally competitive, you need decision makers and resources which are critical. They have to move from the rural areas to the urban areas. If a person in Coimbatore is manufacturing a particular component, if a Sadaji in Ludhiana is manufacturing a particular component, he needs to travel by air, unlike now where he goes away from home for two to three months. He comes in his order book and comes away from home for two to three months. He goes from Thalik headquarters to Thalik headquarters and books his orders and goes back and sends his goods But this one. We need to have mass travel. So if you have a national highway from Bangalore to Delhi, the highway will always be full, like in the US. Nobody travels from San Francisco to uh, New York today. Even a mechanic, a plumber, a nurse will not travel by, by road unless you are a hitchhiker or a tourist wanting to explore the country to write a book. The person from New York to San Francisco will go by air, but the highway is always full because people are getting in and out of the exit all the time. So you need a national highway, you need the trains, you need the ports, but you need air connectivity deep into the interiors to get this economy moving into the interiors. Because regardless of the subsidy and the incentives that the government may give, industry will not go into the rural areas, industry will not disperse, investments will not disperse unless transportation, and I mean transportation, air transportation, along with other things, goes into the nets of this country. So this is the point I was making, and I said that has to happen at a rate which is affordable to the common man. We need, the true sign of a developed economy is that when you have a large number of middle class and lower middle class, to be able to buy a refrigerator and a TV and to be also able to travel by air. When you are targeting this growth, for that growth to happen, aviation must happen. Aviation it itself must grow. So I said, we need to connect these unconnected parts. And that can't happen unless government makes these airports available to me. So I told the government that you have a large number of airports. We need to prioritize our resources uh, uh, in terms of its uh, deployment. Let us not build palatial terminal buildings. The tragedy is that we have got a lot of airports where the terminal buildings are absolutely fantastic, but uh, no air traffic control equipment. So I said for a place like Hubli where you have one flight a day, you don't need any terminal building. You actually require a thatch, you require a zinc sheet, but have a good runway. 
with a basic air traffic control equipment like a VOR, for example, a VHF Omni range, which brings down the, the visibility required for flying and landing to one and a half kilometers, and that costs only one crore. So I told him, for example, Bellari has an airport where Humpy is located, where Hospet is there, where it is, the, the mines are there in Bellari, surrounding Bellari. You've got Hospet there, which is uh, the capital for genes in the country, and you've got Humpy, which is the World Heritage Site. There are three airport, air, airfields there. One belongs to Jindal, one is a grass ship belonging to PWD, and one is an airport where the airport is existing from 1930s, where a first commercial mail flight landed there for, ref for refueling in 1930. So I said, we, these airports can be brought under use with the lowest of investments. So I told the government, just give me two airports to start with, so that I can link these airports and link up the metros. And uh, as you also know, the greatest of tourist attractions in this country, India is probably the richest country in terms of its diversity, as well as tourism, which is well known. We have, the, the, we have Africa has wildlife but no heritage. Europe has heritage but no wildlife. We have heritage and wildlife, and as a wildlife, as in big game, elephants and tigers and lions. We have wildlife and heritage, and we have mountains and desert and beaches. But only three million people coming into the country, as against something like 10 million to Singapore as against something like 4 million only to the Eiffel Tower. But all our great tourist destinations, the great palaces and great temples and forts are in the rural areas. And it is the biggest employer in the country because in tourism, it's the only thing where it will drive down employment down to the village because of handicrafts, because of taxis, because of hotels. So I said we need to connect all these regional centers because how do you get a guy in Ludhiana to come to Hampi? Today he's going to London. He's not coming to Humpy because the flight from Delhi to London is cheaper than uh, going to Humpy. So the minister then looked at disbelief and he said, what is your plan? And I said, I want to start where I want to give fares at the lowest fares and what is it that you can do? And we, I said, I don't want any subsidy. I, all that I want is the bureaucracy to be out of my way to get these things fast. The government was as good as its word, so instead of red, carp, red tape, it became red tape. Uh, instead of red tape, it became red carpet for me. Because it was a very powerful idea. When I said we are going to link all these unconnected parts of the country, in one sense, I had created overnight as a very large political lobby for me across political parties. Oh, 550 MPs, where do they come from? They don't come from Bombay and Delhi. You've got only four MPs in Bombay, two in Bangalore. They come from Kolhapur, they come from Bilgama. And how do they go after their parliament? They come at uh, evening flight, if the parliament gets over, and then they take a night train or a, they drive in their car whole night and reach Belgaum. And again they leave on a Sunday night, drive whole night and take a Monday morning flight. It is a nightmare. So when I went and said I'm going to link all these plots, it was a politically uh, very powerful idea and uh, doors opened for me. And uh, we launched uh, with one aircraft, one flight to Hubli. And uh, today we are grown from one to 15 aircrafts. Next month I'm taking delivery of two more airbuses. That is one to 17 in as many months. Uh, and one flight, by end of this month, we'll be doing 100 flights a day. Because we just launched flights out of Delhi to Dehradun. Dehradun is the gateway to the Himalayas. It's capital of Uttaranchal. Uh, people who want to bury the ashes come there. People who want to get salvation come there. All the famous mutts are there in Hardwar and Rishikesh. Also, it is the gateway to the Badrinath and Kedarnath and gateway to the trekkers. There's an airfield, a fantastic airfield, but no flights. Kanpo, which, is, which used to be the manufacturing capital during the British Empire, which is a population equal to that of Norway, which is 5 million. And, and 20 million passenger seats in Norway. And we don't have a single flight to Norway. 
It used to be the manufacturing capital. Somebody from Kanpur wrote me a letter. This is the history of Kanpur. Can you please come and connect this, uh, connect this city? So we are starting from February 1st. We'll be linking places like Jabalpur and Kanpur. Now we have got daily flights to Agra, daily flights to Dehradun, daily flights to Amritsar. There's a flight from Sing Singapore to Amritsar, but no flight from Delhi to Amritsar. There are three flights a week from Indian Airlines. So we grew from one to 100. It's unprecedented in, I think, uh, corporate aviation history, uh, this kind of growth. Uh, we also did the third thing to make this happen, uh, which is uh, uh, the technology that we used uh, for distribution of our tickets. As you know, all the conventional airlines distribute the tickets to the travel agent through a proprietary reservation system, which is hosted privately out of Houston or one or two other countries. And the customer doesn't pay the airline, the airline doesn't pay the the customer doesn't pay the travel agent, travel agent doesn't pay the airline till after the flight takes place. And to access this reservation system, each of your tickets has anything from four to eight dollars. Each time you buy a ticket, let's say Bangalore, Delhi, Delhi, Lucknow, each of that leg has about four to eight dollars, which is the money that you pay for accessing that reservation system, which the airline charges from you and pays that company, which is giving you this reservation system. Because unless today the man in New York the travel agent in New York and the travel agent in Dehradun, travel agent in Tumkur sees the same screen. You can't fill the plane. Similarly, the airport needs to be linked. The airport has global companies which give you a plug point, like you plug in for electricity so, so that airlines can plug in and link and hook their airports to the reservation systems, which are appropriate reservation systems. All the low-cost airlines do it differently. And I'm doing it much more differently than the other low-cost airlines. All the low-cost airlines have one model of aircraft to bring down the costs of diverse aircrafts. They have uh, their own internet-based reservation systems. And they all subscribe to network companies to give you network access to the airports. Because of the tremendous advancement in the internet and software technology and the kind of uh, software prowess that we have, I said that why do I give this internet reservation system to a foreign company? Because an American company called Accenture came to me who got a stranglehold on the low-cost airlines. And I told them, you must be getting this done in some back office in Bangalore. So give it to me at a lower rate. They said it took them 10 years to perfect it. And, and, the, and the, the tone was arrogant. So the biggest... Uh, uh, and the riskiest and the most, I think, um, fortunate decision that I took was I gave it to an Indian company. The American company told me they would need 60 days to put that template and customize it to India. And every consultant, fortunately whom I didn't consult, told me, in India, low-cost airlines will not succeed because it's an over-regulated market. Airports are a nightmare. And uh, internet is key. And you have a, a, a tremendous software prowess, but it is more for exports. You need common people to buy, so it's not going to work. And I knew in my bones that uh, it was a, a great uh, business model. It was a great dream. And so I could get people to buy this dream, but more importantly, that, that is a model which was scalable and there's a model which was workable in India. I knew that if I gave the lowest fares, people would find a way of buying it. And all that I had to do was to customize it to the Indian context. So we gave this uh, software development to an Indian company and I said, ensure that we can make it work in India. So we put up a call center, 24 hour call center, because the call center concept was basically for BPO. You know, you have a call center for Lufthansa. You have a call center for, you know, Microsoft or, you know, GE Capital. So people call in America, but the call comes here. And the call center in India answers for a reservation for Lufthansa in New York or Germany. 
So I said that call center must be here in regional language in India. So what we did was we built a fantastic system where people could call 24 hours, 365 days in the regional languages. So it will cut down my cost because I don't have to have an office in each city. And you could call up the call center and buy a ticket on the phone. And it takes all of three minutes to give a credit card and buy a ticket at 12, in the, 12 o'clock in the night for a 6 o'clock morning Chennai flight. And the call center is linked to the reservation system. The reservation system is hosted on the internet. And that reservation system is linked to the payment gateway of two banks. And the, if the credit card gets honored, the money gets debited to the uh, man who buys the ticket. And the money gets transferred to my account online. And if you don't have a credit card, then you can buy the ticket on the phone and you can deposit the money in any of our collection points. We've got 24 collection points in Bangalore where you can go and deposit the money. And the collection point keeps 2.5% and pays the balance to me online again through the internet. You can also go to the internet sitting in New York or sitting in your village and buy it, which is the cheapest. You can go to the travel agent and buy it, but the travel agent has to switch off his system, get on the internet, and pay me. Only when he pays me, it generates a ticket because the inventory is not under his control. In the existing system, the travel agent will hold reservations for you in three airlines or in the same airline for three different days. So it and creates havoc for the airline and increases costs because what happens is when you have reservations for three airlines, or three different dates on the same airline, the airline comes to know only at the time of boarding who is boarding and who is not boarding. So either you have 110 people for 100 seats, which means you have to order catering for all the 100, and then you have to manage the 10 extra people who will land up at the airport and give them accommodation, or only 40 people turn up and you carry 60 empty seats. It increases costs. The airline doesn't get the money. At any given time, airlines have receivables of in excess of 1,000 crores from travel agents. Because you've got 5,000 travel agents across the world. The money is paid, so there's a cost to that money, cost to bad debt. And to get that money, airlines again pay another 3% to the clearing house. And the travel agents take up to 10% to distribute the ticket. And they have complete strangle on this. And entire travel agent community came to me and said they're going to boycott me. Because if I didn't give them credit, I said, it's an idea whose time has come. I said, you're going against the tide. Change your ways, because we're not going to change our ways. And at the end of three months, the travel agents fell in line. Now we have a credit card issued for them, which is called as a travel agent purchase card, where they can buy a ticket using that credit card. They get 40 days credit from the uh, credit card company, but I get my money upfront from the credit card company. It's an exclusive travel agent credit card. They can also give me deposit, and it's a revolving deposit, and they can top it up as in by, by, the, by the ticket because they can see their account in their computer at their end. But they deduct the money, their commission, and pay me. So we did not print a single ticket till today because ticket printing is a security document. It costs a lot of money. Delivering the ticket costs a lot of money. Then getting the ticket counterfoils again costs a lot of money. And you need an army of accountants. So we have 3,000 travel agents now just one accountant handling it. So this distribution cost reduces 20% uh, of my fare. It's a great, uh, so today even if you go to the remotest uh, Taluk headquarters, you'll have a board there, something like a internet cafe or something like that. So I got Telawalas who come to me and ask, how do I buy this ticket? Today, 40% of my flight are generally first time travelers. In an Airbus flight, Bangalore, Delhi, out of 180 seats, there are 40 seats on a Bangalore, Delhi, which is 11,500 published fare of other airlines. We've got 40 seats in every flight every day where the fare is from rupees 500 to 2,500. The average works out to 1,800. That means you could be sitting next to somebody who's paid 4,000, the other guy could have been paid 500. And the last minute traveler, pays 6,400, as you can 11,500. So I got another 140 seats from rupees 3,000 to 6,000. So you could go to the internet, which is happening now, where there's a marriage party where they go and buy 40 tickets. 
and it is interactive. It is a dynamic pricing, and the di and the software is built to accommodate the individual myriad needs. If there is a retired person who wants to visit his daughter in Delhi, then he'll buy the ticket 90 days in advance and get it at 500 rupees or 1,000 rupees because time is not of importance to him. He wants to go any date when he gets the lowest fare. So there's, in the website, you go there and say, lowest fare. And it will give you the, all, the days when the lowest fare is available. So you buy the ticket on the day when it is available with the lowest fare. And you go on the date because you don't care the date because you want to go and visit your daughter, you're retired. Similarly, if you're a mechanic who, who, has, who has got a child somewhere else, who is another mechanic, he could go by air. The idea being the businessman or the politician who goes in the last minute pays a higher fare, but even then he'll be paying about 30 to 40% cheaper. And a small and medium enterprises man will probably adjust it three to four days in advance or seven to eight days in advance. If you're going in a morning seven o'clock flight, you'll go in an afternoon 11 o'clock flight. We still not done it, but eventually we'll do it. On, on a Friday night, it'll be the costlier ticket. On a Saturday afternoon, it'll be a cheaper ticket. Morning seven o'clock will be a slightly costlier ticket. 12 o'clock afternoon flight will be a slightly cheaper ticket. So the businessman costs it and goes accordingly. And the, and the software is basically designed to interact to that, to that kind of a social need or a business need. And today we're the largest uh, e-commerce site. We have uh, something like about uh, $400,000 coming into our account before the flight. So which is a huge uh, advantage and we pass it on. Uh, Low-cost airlines do things fundamentally differently. It's a point-to-point -point airline. We don't undertake connections. And there's a reason when sometimes when our flight gets canceled in our case, because it's a new airline, and all the flights of aircraft are flying, we can't have a situation where we can rescue a passenger when a flight is canceled. We just refund the money. So the need for that is to have more number of flights so that when you miss one flight, we can put you on the next flight. So we need to scale up. So we have raised a private equity of $50 million now. So the same venture capital company which uh, turned us down six years ago, ICICI, uh, we had uh, six global investors who came to invest with us. And today we have given away some more equity and we have raised uh, $50 million. And uh, we have signed for 30 Airbuses now, which is a $1.2 billion deal. The Airbuses will start coming from next month. The idea being, uh, we have changed the business model of a low-cost airline. India being a country with these kind of large cities in a population which have grown in wealth in the wake of reforms and there is they are straining for connectivity and the smaller aircrafts because the Boeing can't go to a Kolhapur city Kolhapur kind of city because the larger the aircraft the cost per seat comes down cost per seat per nautical mile Smaller the aircraft, the cost goes up. So if I have a 10-seater, then it can't be economical. If I have a 180-seater, it goes to Kolhapur. If all the seats are full, you'll get the cheapest seat, Bangalore, Kolhapur, but you'll only get 30 passengers. So you had to have an ideal mix. So we took a 48-seater so it can carry enough luggage. Stand-up cabin is pressurized, flies at 20,000 feet. The idea that maybe we are a little ahead of time for Kolhapur, or maybe we are already late. But we are going to open up these markets and ride on the economic boom that we are going to create ourselves. Much in the way when the railroads opened up America 150 years ago, and uh, they had to literally face the Red Indians and open it up. And uh, they rode on the economic uh, boom that they created. So for me, the imagery was, today India is the largest uh, producer of rice in the world, largest producer of vegetable in the world, largest producer of milk in the world, uh, largest scooter plant if we have it. So it's a country rich with resources. So I felt that this it is is a big scalable model to 
put a different model of aircraft to these smaller towns because that's where the challenge is. And that's where, for me, the biggest adrenal rush is that to, to it is a no-brainer doing Bombay, Delhi. But it's a great challenge to do when the sectors are short, the cost goes up. When the planes are small, the cost goes up. And because each time you land and take off in short sectors, the landing and taking off, the engine cycles, the cost goes up. And because each time you land and take off in short sectors, the landing and taking off, the engine cycles, the cost goes up. And these short sectors, uh, we put a turbo prop. So that 10 years from now, if Kolhapur becomes a big city, which I think it will, you, then you put an Airbus there, and the aircraft will probably go to Hassan or to some other town. And so we have these a, small 48 seaters to go to these regional towns, and we have air buses to go to the trunk routes. So if I put an Airbus 380, which can put 850 passengers on board, we can give every seat Bangalore, Delhi at 1,600 rupees. The biggest constraint for us today or for costs is infrastructure, size of our fleets of the country, and rules and regulations. I'll just end with this, because some of you are in positions of power to do things. When I say infrastructure, what is the biggest uh, asset of an air airfield? It's a runway. You need, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you don't need to be a chartered accountant or an economist. You need more aircraft to so land it. Get out of the runway. Aircraft have to come and get out. Aircraft have to come and get out so that you unload, disgorge more number of passengers and get more passengers into there. Because aircrafts make money when they're in the air. They don't make money when they're on the ground. So all the low-cost airlines fly more number fast. And how do you fly more number fast if you can't get in and out of the airport fast? So there's airport congestion, airport inefficiency. Oil company may not come and refuel on time. The ground handling people may not do it on time. Because there are different agencies to make a flight happen. Air traffic control is sitting on his backside. He doesn't know how, how important it is to get the aircraft safely and fast, not one without the other, out of the runway. Now, we have a, two runways in Delhi. Only one is being used. In that one runway, we are doing 25 flights an hour. As against 45 to 50 all over the world. Heathrow handles 1,000 flights. Delhi handles 300 flights. And Heathrow operates only for uh, 18 hours. Six hours is a curfew, environmental curfew. Plus they got five other airports. Now, if the runway occupies the same time for a four-seater, and a 50-seater, and a 180-seater, and a 800-seater, then it is stupid to put a 4-seater in the same runway as a 800-seater when you have got a congestion problem. You have to get the 4-seater into a different runway so that you have to have smaller airports. Like most cities have four or five airports. Paris has got three major airports. London has got five airports. Get into only a London city. Plus 10 other small, small airports where all these sports flying takes place. Now, if you put a four-seater into the same runway as an 850-seater, obviously, you know, you are making the airport inefficient. Second, there is a systemic problem. What is an airport? It's a real estate. If today you are building a mall in Delhi, when you sign the document with the landowner and you make a brochure with the architect, your marketing people start going out and selling the space. Now, in our country now, for whatever reason, you have to run behind the airport to get your space. So there is a systemic problem. The airport authority chairman says, look, if I allot land to you, then the CBI will come after me, vigilance will come after me. And here's the problem. So we have to go through a process. Now, if you are, if you are an airport authority, which is a revenue earning, this one, then the moment he sees in the paper, I'm starting an airline, his marketing people should come to me. Like what happens abroad. Like already, the Hyderabad International Airport, the, their marketing manager came to me three times. 
even though the airport is going to be built after three years. Now, I had to run from pillar to post to get my parking space. There's no hangar. We built a Taj Mahal in this country, which is unsurpassed, and we don't have hangars. Today, I don't have a hangar for my Airbus. If we can buy an Airbus costing 200 crores, I can build a hangar. My application is lying with the airport authority for the last eight months, saying that give me a hangar, they don't have a hangar. Or allot me a place where I can build a hangar. Now it increases cost. So I had to go to Air India hangar. Auto engineers hangar for my competitors. So last time I had a bird hit in Delhi, and the aircraft had to be taken to Bombay. Empty. Because Indian Airlines did not get me a place there, so I had to go to Air India hangar. So there are only four hangars. One in Delhi, one in Bombay, one in Calcutta, one in Delhi. So the, the government is seized at the, at the top of the necessity of, I think, investing on in infrastructure. I think what is not realized is the systemic problems that we have here. And I think the urgency is not there. Bombay and Delhi are already congested with the lowest efficiency in the world. With the lowest number of flights, it's already congested. I did not get parking place in Bombay. If they knew that I'm starting an airline, I, they have given me an import license. How should it work? If they have given me an import license, where I've already shown them evidence that I'm bringing an Airbus, what is parking space? It is dumping some concrete so that you can take that 70 tons and doing it. Till today, they're not given a parking space for me in Delhi. They're not given me in Bombay. Why? Because that ownership is not there. That passion is not there. That pride is not there. So there is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. And uh, the second is we have problems with our rules and regulations, which are 1937. Aircraft Act of 1937 is still applicable. And Dr. Kasturinga knows the kind of adv technology advances that we have made. That rules have to change. Those, because those rules are increasing my costs by 15 to 20%. There's a rule which says that every time an aircraft lands, an engineer has to inspect it. So we go to Hubli, engineer has to inspect it. So it goes to Hubli, Belgaum, Kolapur, Bombay, it goes to 10 places. All over the world, engineer signs in the morning and releases it. That is valid for 24 hours. And the pilot does the walk around inspection. He has got all the instruments which give any defects. Then he walks around and sees whether the tire pressure is already any leakage and he flies. In India, they say the engineer has to inspect it. So I removed a passenger seat and put an engineer and he goes in the flight. And since we started at 5 in the morning and fly till 10, I got four engineers now to do the flight inspections, then they can't maintain because they're in the flight morning to night. And I got another fifth engineer in the night to do the maintenance because maintenance is done at night. Line maintenance, major maintenance is done in the hangar when it comes for a schedule. But the line maintenance is done at night. The aircrafts come back at 10 in the night all over the world. It has a flight at 5 in the morning. So you maintain between 10 to 5. So you have one more engineer to do the maintenance and four engineers. So, so these rules and regulations are also increased costs. And the last constraining factor is our manpower. We have exported, uh, as you know, I mean, we have the brightest of minds uh, all over the world. I think all of your children must be somewhere in the US or wherever. Uh, but in engineering of av aviation, today my engineers are from uh, Romania and Algeria and France and Nepal. I've got third world country engineers in my aviation because this sector has not grown and we don't have trained good manpower. We've exported engineers for the last 50 years, but we don't have engineers. Again, it has got to do something to do with, we can't blame the government for this. There's a fundamental systemic problem. So if the aviation sector grows, then I don't have to bring foreign engineers. Uh, I don't have to send also my engines even for the minute, if I want to change a bearing in a Rolls-Royce engine, I have to airlift the engine today to Singapore. Singapore, you throw a stone, it falls into the sea. There's nothing there. But the engine facilities are there. I asked him, why you have to put the engine facilities in India? He says, look, Singapore caters to the whole region. So if they want to pull out an engine, take out a part, they can take it from Singapore and send it to Hong Kong, send it to Vietnam, send it to Laos, send it to Cambodia. But in India, if I bring a part inside to take it out to Pakistan, it is a nightmare. So it is easier to send it from Singapore to Nepal rather than from Delhi to Kathmandu, which is one hour flight. So there is a 
problem. So these rules and regulations have a big impact on our costs. So if they change, if we have an engine maintenance facility in India, without having the 100 aircrafts, because somebody said, if you have 100 aircrafts like China, 800 aircrafts, Rolls Royce will put up a facility. But Singapore doesn't have 800 aircrafts. They still have it there. Singapore has got only two, two helicopters on the register. We have got 150. But every helicopter facilities in Singapore not here. That's why, because, because of the kind of rules and regulations that we have in place, which has to do with the Commerce Ministry, the Finance Ministry, and the Customs. So, as uh, I think uh, it was somebody who said that India has been a, uh, it is, it is, India is the intellectual capital of the world. It has been a country of potential. Uh, it, 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 got the, it is a country of the greatest potential, but I think we have been a country of potential for too long. The time to tap that is now. And uh, with all this, uh, I feel that we are the greatest country. Uh, it's the greatest opportunity today. It's a great country to live in. And uh, so that's that it. I'm not cynical. All I'm trying to say is that, uh, uh, like, uh, I think it was General Hannibal who said, I think he told his troops, uh, we'll find a way. And he said, if none exists, he, says, he, he told them, he said, you find a way. If none exists, he said, make one. So I think with that spirit, uh, we'll be able to solve our problems. And we have exceeded the time under 10, 15 minutes. Thanks for your patient hearing. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll take it. We really appreciate the Air Dickens effort. And we are getting a you message. Are, can I have your name? Where are from? Your name? CM Sharma. DGM from Power Grid Corporation, Government of India organization. Only uh, one message I am getting uh, from Air Deccan that every step has cost. And Air Deccan has come up realizing the cost has to be cut and every step has cost. That is a very big message. It comes in our mind. Now, sir, I have three points that India Airlines or maybe Jet or any Sahara, they are asking the loo, uh, to Bangalore, say, about 10,000 or so. You are operating at average 1,000 rupees. No, 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 5,000 rupees. 5,000. 4,800. So, okay, 5,000. So, the 50% means the other India Airlines, they are having high margin in their uh, air freight, air fares? No, no. See, the, the model itself is different. The three basic areas where you... Uh, where means you their savings are more? I'll, I'll tell you. No, no, their models. It's like a Brian and ODP hotel. You know, you need them. They do certain things which we don't do. The three things that you do which are totally fundamentally different. Firstly, we fly more number of hours. For example, Alliance Air has got 14 aircrafts and, it, and they do 40 flights a day. We have uh, eight aircrafts and we do 80 flights a day. So we fly more number of hours. We start early, end up late, and in between we turn around fast. Conventional airlines, they have what is known as a hub and spoke model. You know, an aircraft waits for other aircrafts to come in. One is Indian Airlines, basically being a government company, they're not very efficient. Uh, but having said that, even in the private sector, the model is what is known as a hub and spoke model. There's an aircraft in Bombay which waits for the aircraft from Amsterdam to come in. What it does is, it waits for an aircraft from Ahmedabad to come in. So this aircraft is so scheduled to wait for one hour before it takes off, after it comes from somewhere else. Because they want to provide for this cushion of the flight timings of other airlines. So at the end of the day, you end up spending a lot of time on the ground. If you have an asset which costs 200 crores, and if you fly 8 hours a day, and if I fly 12 hours a day, or 11 hours a day, so if I fly 30% more, the aircraft asset utilization is 30% more, so you bring down my cost by 20%. The first most important element. Second, we have more number of seats. We have removed the business class. We removed the extra toilet, which is meant only for the business class. We have removed, we have removed the storage space, which are required for catering and other things. So I got 22% more seats. Same Airbus, I got 180 seats, as against 142 seats in Indian Airlines. So 22% more seats. So that brings only cost by another 15%. So, so whatever uh, model or exercise or efficiency you have increased and to reduce the cost, 
I think the other airlines will follow your model. No, they can't. They can't follow it because unless you change, they, 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 can, they need to follow it in their own dress because their lower end of the economy travelers, they want to hold on to them. So they should not migrate. So low cost airlines go, does good in two ways. One is I'm stimulating demand from any sector. Their travelers will not come to us, but their lower end of travelers will come to us. Their leisure travelers, when they're co going on their personal travel, will come to us. Yesterday when I was coming from Bombay, the guy who was sitting next to me, uh, he said, are you Captain Gopi? I said, yes. And uh, I said, uh, I said, how did you buy the ticket? And he said, I bought it on the internet. He said, how much he paid? He said, I paid 1,000 rupees. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm the president of uh, ACC. You know, it's a huge company. I don't know, he must be earning 3 lakhs a month. So when you're traveling in the personal travel, you use a company like us. So they can't, uh, they, will, they, they must bring down the costs in their own interest because their costs are high. But not to come to my level and not to target my customers. They are catered to a different segment, but they need to bring down the cost because when a full service carrier increases the cost without reference to a low cost carrier, let's say, you reach a point where your fares are higher than what the market can afford. That means there are not enough number of people in the, in the economy, in that income bracket, who can afford your fares. So for that reason, they need to bring down their fares. Second is, they need to change the model. See, if you don't change the hub and spoke model, you can't bring down your fares. If you don't increase the number of seats, you can't bring down your fares. So without changing the model, if you change the fares, then you're bleeding. Third, uh, our distribution model saves you about 20% distribution of tickets on the internet. Now they can't do that unless they change their model of travel agent uh, uh, ticketing model. So, as far as maintenance is concerned, we have given our, for example, maintenance of our engines to Rolls Royce. We've got a power by the hour contract. Every hour that we fly, we pay so many, so many dollars. And the entire maintenance is taken care of by Rolls Royce. We, we, have, uh, we are not even given to a third party. Uh, my, uh, my avionics have given the contract to Honeywell because the avionics are Honeywell. My line inventory management and uh, supply of parts are given to a Dutch company. So what we have done is, because we are a new airline, we don't want to do it ourselves. We said, pay a little more, but give to a company. So I got $6 billion worth of parts on site. And entire engineering is outsourced to uh, you know, foreign companies. Sir, my yeah. last, last question. Well, last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is regarding the security. When you go to the isolated airstrips, how do you manage the security and other aspects? See, what we have done is, uh, in places like Hubli and all that, uh, we have given all this to uh, our station. Let's say if I'm going to Hubli, my, actually my Hubli flight is at 6 in the morning. I land there at uh, 6.50. After 20, 15 minutes, the aircraft is off. So there was uh, no point for me to appoint my own people there. So barring for three, four security guards, whom are again on part-time uh, in terms of, you know, we tell them you do what you want. So Treating the passengers and all that. Everything is we are given on contract to the local people there. We give them 2% or 3% commission on the tickets that they sell in the airport. And we give them a few thousand rupees per flight for handling the bags. Because they had to remove the bags from the 48 passengers, they remove the bags and they had to unload, and then load the bags again. So we thought it's good to give it to the local people because it will generate employment and also local participation. Plus, if he's a local businessman, he'll deploy them somewhere else. So in most airports, I don't have a single employee. I've just given it off to, uh, you know, contractors across the country, including Bangalore. In Bangalore, my ticketing is not my man. I've given a contract to somebody. He sells the tickets, and he can't sell it unless he pays me upfront. So in the computer that you find, in the airport, it is linked through a lease line, through a VSAT, through a p and line, the three backups to that in Hubli. So the Hubli airport looks at the same screen, I took advantage of the internet backbone and the uh, VSAT. So the Hubli airport is linked to the same screen that a man in New York is watching. Uh, uh, Mr. Gopinath, uh, first uh, let me congratulate you and we should be proud of you because uh, I have been traveling uh, international airlines for the last two decades, and we are sick of depending on these people for everything. And at least uh, 
there is a hope that in the coming uh, uh, future, in maybe one or two decades, there might be uh, a company which flies uh, international destinations, not only the cost but the pride of being an Indian company. Do you have the vision or a plan uh, for such an effort? Uh, right now, I'm totally focused. As you know, it is not easy to uh, build a, a scale at what we have done because typically what happens, uh, uh, especially in the overseas, or when a new low-cost carrier comes, the established player immediately brings down the fares in that one particular sector. You are doing two flights, he's got 400 flights. In those two flights, he brings the fare down so low and drives you out of the market. So that is the reason why we are doing what we are doing. We are establishing a national presence so that it is difficult for them to bring the fares down across all sectors unless he hemorrhages faster than me. And the second thing is uh, to create this kind of a network across the country uh, is not easy. And the market is so big within India, so I'm really focused on that. But however, I'm only looking at uh, the short sectors in the international side. Uh, Basically, I'm looking at Middle, Middle East because we have about 2 million care lights there, or there. We have more Indians there in Middle East than uh, so most of them are plumbers and masons and nurses and clerks. And it's a big tragedy that you know at the end of three years or four years or five years when he comes back home, half his savings go into your ticket. So I think that lends itself to my dreams and my model, which probably I'll do a couple of years down the line or a year down the line. But right now, uh, we are focused on this. For a low-cost airlines to succeed on an international flight, you need to be able to get in and out of the airport fast. So in Europe, it has succeeded because uh, Europe has become like one country in terms of currency and in terms of the rules and regulations. They've got one regulation for the entire country. You know? They call what is known as a JAR, Joint Airworthiness Regulations. So uh, Ryanair, goes and lands in a subsidiary airport next to Paris and gets out in 15 minutes. If you go and get stuck up in international airports where you've got ground handling problems, uh, like you said, or security problems, then, you know, a low-cost airlines will not be able to take advantage in bringing down the fares. So probably we should be able to do it in countries uh, where, you know, it's easy to get in and out of the airport fast. May I ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, this question is basically on your uh, business plan and on your cost-cutting measures. Uh, at present, are you able to recover your operating costs out of uh, internet sales or? Uh, yeah, we are already. Uh, we are going to be in profit this year. We are going to declare a profit. Just on your internet sales. What about your? No, no. My entire C, uh, uh, There are four points of sale. Uh, one is uh, the call center. Another is the internet. Third is uh, travel agents. Fourth is corporates who are registered with us. We give, we give them a login ID and corporates can generate tickets for their employees. But, and then the f uh, fifth is the airport. We also introduce a mobile internet ticketing van now, which I'm going to increase now. We're going to have at least 10 in Bangalore in the next uh, one month. It is a mobile van where uh, the van goes to the Koramangala BDA shopping complex every day from morning 6 to 10. So people in the residence and locality know it is there. It is basically to break the travel agent uh, nexus. And that with taking advantage of the mobile phones, we are linked to the mobile phone to the computer. There's a computer in the mobile van. And the mobile van can go to the internet and generate an e-ticket for the customer who wants to buy it from the mobile van. So we got about five, six points of sale. But all of them had to go to the internet and transfer the money to my account before they can generate a ticket, including my own airport. Because the airport there is, again, a ticketing agent. So 100% of my revenue comes through an e-commerce, but 50% of sales are purchased through the call center and the internet today, and about 30% from the travel agents, and about 10% from corporates, and about 10 to 15% from the airports. Where is your money going to come in from uh, in terms of your expansion? Is it through in-flight uh, advertising? No, to expansion your... uh, uh, is obviously from three sources. One is uh, initially to expand, you need equity base, so we're raising equity. We require debts, uh, we're raising debt. And the third is, uh, uh, you know, expanding through our own internal accounts. 
So all the three we are doing it. Uh, sales, uh, uh, we also, you know, a, a cost center is a revenue center for us, many of them. We have got in-freight sales. We have got in-freight uh, catering sales. I'll just give an example. You know, if 20 people buy water in a, in my, 20 to 25 people buy water on a 48-seater. And so there's revenue for me because we make about 15% on that sales. Whatever you buy is about 40 to 50 rupees. We've got sandwiches and things like that. But if I give free water, then I need to put 100 bottles of water on board because you need to plan for two for, per passenger. Then the aerosols will drink. When they get in, they'll take home. Pilots will drink. They'll take some home. The baggage cleaner, handler, when he comes in, cleans the aircraft, he'll say, humko bhi ek pani do. You're not going to say no to a man who cleans the aircraft to give a water. He'll get take water. Passenger will drink, and he'll carry home. So you, you need to have 100. So if I'm flying 1.5 million passengers, I need 3 million bottles of water, which is 3 crores. Straight away on water. I don't even allow free newspapers to be put on uh, uh, put on board because passengers mess up the uh, paper. Then I need the aerosols to clean it up and fold it. So unless uh, the air, unless the newspaper gives me money to promote its product, I don't allow newspapers on board my aircraft from people who want to put it free. So you have to be obsessed with uh, costs. Uh, your employee ratio is very slow. We do multitasking. Uh, we we have given, for example, one of our aircrafts, and we get uh, uh, 15, 20 lakhs a month for that space we are given on, on the exterior of the aircraft. So wherever you can make money, you take it and then uh, pass it on to the customer. ADA. Uh, my question is, from the customer point of view, there are three important parameters for uh, the aircraft, for the airline. That is, one is punctuality, safety, and cost. You have addressed the last point uh, very nicely. You have addressed that. Can you just tell us uh, how you are addressing the first two points, namely punctuality and safety? Yeah. See, uh, in fact, uh, the, the most important thing for a low-cost airline is we simply say we will take you on a clean aircraft from a from point A to point B on time. Rest, we'll not do anything else, and we'll not apologize for not doing any of those things. Uh, if my air hostess pushes you into the aircraft faster, I'm not going to apologize for it, because only if you get into the aircraft fast, I can take off fast. So we're not going to be apologetic about things we shouldn't be apologetic about. We want to give you the lowest fare. For this, we need to do certain things. So when you turn around fast, you're turning around fast basically because you want to get them into the aircraft and out so that you go to the next destination, and the next, and the next. So in a aircraft which does 10 flights a day, if you are 10 minutes more time on each airport, at the end of the day, you are two hours on the ground. That is the philosophy. But what you actually do is that in your effort to get out of the airport fast, because you want to get out fast, because of 15 minutes, you're also on time. But for a new airline which starts, punctuality is a big problem to start with, because let's say you have a technical problem, or like recently we had a fog problem. We had 180 passengers who came from Guwahati. They were to land in Delhi. The aircraft was diverted to Jaipur. It could not land there. Then they diverted to Ahmedabad. So we had 180 passengers who had to be unloaded in uh, Delhi. And we had 180 in Delhi who had to be taken to Chennai, Hyderabad and Chennai. So the 180 in Delhi got left behind. But the aircraft hovered for one hour over Delhi and then finally ended up in Ahmedabad at 10 in the night. Now, the aircraft is stuck there. My aircraft got stuck there till 10 o'clock next day morning. Now, some flights had to be canceled because you can't make up if you lose 10 hours. And if you have three aircrafts, like in my case now, A buses, I'm getting two more next month and another two more. But if you have only, let's say, three aircrafts, and all the three aircrafts are flying from morning to evening, if there's one, glitch in one airport, either because of a technical problem, because one fuse is gone, or uh, uh, there's an engine oil leak, which requires a fixing, which takes three to four hours, then it has a snowballing effect. There's nothing you can do except, you know, cross your fingers and wait for it not to happen by improving your inventory management, improving your engineering skills. But regardless of what you do, this will happen. And you can't get over it unless you have eight flights a day between Bangalore and Delhi. In which case, you cancel one flight, you can put the passengers in the next three flights. 
you can't have a spare aircraft nobody has a spare aircraft unless you reach a level of about 25 to 30 aircrafts so that is one reason why what we did were two things one is we ordered all brand new aircrafts so that our because we found that because of the depreciation because of the kind of support we are getting because of the cheap funding that is available because india is a after china today india is the biggest destination india has what china doesn't have we have a very mature financial market we have we have a legal framework which can which can uh, help financial markets operate so there's a tremendous optimism in india so we were able to get funds at a fantastically low rate of 2 to 3% so i signed for 30 apses which is a 1.2 billion order it's the biggest in india's history and their idea was i'll phase out my old planes and get only brand new planes so that your on time performance improves because the planes are new and second i will also scale up my, my operations so i'll have more number of aircrafts so there is one uh, aspect on the punctuality side what we have done second is on the safety side as i mentioned earlier uh you can you have to be in this business model which we have set for ourselves you have to be fast you have to be safe and you have to be low cost and not one without the other if you are safe and uh, high cost you're going to be out of business if you're going to be low cost and uh, and if you're unsafe i think uh, it is a wrong business model when you are going to go bankrupt i don't think you can survive an accident easily in aviation so i think it is a discipline you have to bring on yourself to be safe because it is fundamentally going to kill you it is suicidal to be unsafe in business especially in this business so what we have done to address that uh, is that all our, our overhauls and all our maintenance we are given to the manufacturers in the turbo props we are given to the manufacturer himself so there is a single point of contact uh, in turbo props the, um, the atr had that system so entire atr we pay them so many dollars an hour and uh, they manage the inventory they stock the inventory here i can have 10 million dollars 20 million dollars i don't want to pay for it Uh, i only pay a lease rental for that but i pay through a maybe i'll pay 1 dollar more per hour through lease rentals so i got 6 million dollars worth of parts on site it doesn't belong to me it belongs to the manufacturer i can take what i want when i want if the aircraft gets grounded for want of parts because i am paying him for parts that i'm going to use 6 months now from now for parts which are going to come for overhaul after 3 months or one year i'm going to pay up front every month every month as it flies avionics we are giving it to honeywell for brakes we are giving it to goodrich for overall inventory management we are giving it to uh, a scandinavian company which is part of sas so we have addressed uh, safety in this manner thank you captain okay